General audience number nine, November 14th, 1979. Following the narrative of Genesis, we observed that the definitive creation of man consists in the creation of the unity of two beings. Their unity denotes, above all, the identity of human nature. Duality, on the other hand, shows what, on the basis of this identity, constitutes the masculinity and femininity of created man. This ontological dimension of unity and duality has, at the same time, an axiological meaning. From the text of Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, and the whole context, it is clear that man has been created as a particular value before God. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. But also as a particular value from man himself. First, because he is man. Second, because the woman is for the man, and vice versa, the man for the woman. While Genesis chapter 1 expresses this value in a purely theological and indirectly metaphysical form, Genesis chapter 2, by contrast, reveals, so to speak, the first circle of experience lived by man as a value. This experience is inscribed already in the meaning of original solitude, and then in the whole account of the creation of man as male and female. The concise text of Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, which contains the words of the first man on seeing the newly created woman taken from him, can be considered the biblical prototype of the Song of Songs. In addition, if it is possible to read impressions and emotions through such remote words, one could even venture to say that the depth and power of this first and original emotion of the man before the humanity of the woman, and at the same time before the femininity of the other human being, seems something unique and unrepeatable. Communion of persons. In this way, the meaning of man's original unity through masculinity and femininity expresses itself as an overcoming of the frontier of solitude, and at the same time as an affirmation for both human beings of everything in solitude that constitutes man. In the biblical account, solitude is the way that leads to the unity that we can define following Vatican II as communio personarum. As we observed before, in his original solitude, man reaches personal consciousness in the process of distinction from all living beings, animalia. And at the same time, in this solitude, he opens himself toward a being akin to himself, defined by Genesis as a help similar to himself, from Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 and verse 20. This opening is no less decisive for man as a person. In fact, it is perhaps more decisive than the distinction itself. The man's solitude in the Yahwist account presents itself to us not only as the first discovery of the characteristic transcendence proper to the person, but also as the discovery of an adequate, adequate relation to the person, and thus as an opening toward and waiting for a communion of persons. One could also use the term community here, if it were not so generic and did not have so many meanings. Communio says more, and with greater precision, because it indicates precisely the help that derives in some way from the very fact of existing as a person beside a person. In the biblical account, this fact becomes eo ipso, through itself, existence of the person for the person given that in his original solitude man existed in some way already in this relation. This is confirmed, in a negative sense, precisely by his solitude. In addition, the communion of persons could form itself only on the basis of a double solitude of the man and the woman, or as an encounter in their distinction from the world of living beings, animalia, which gave to both the possibility of being and existing in a particular reciprocity. The concept of help also expresses this reciprocity in existence, which no other living being could have ensured. Indispensable for this solitude was everything that was constituted in providing the foundation for the solitude of each, and thus also self-knowledge and self-determination, that is, subjectivity, and the awareness of the meaning of one's own body. 
The account of the creation of man in Genesis chapter 1 affirms from the beginning and directly that man was created in the image of God inasmuch as he is male and female. The account of, in Genesis chapter 2, by contrast, does not speak of the image of God, but reveals in the manner proper to it that the complete and definitive creation of man, subject first to the experience of original solitude, expresses itself in giving life to the communio personarum that man and woman form. In this way, the Yahwist account agrees with the content of the first account. If vice versa, we want to retrieve also from the account of the Yahwist text the concept of image of God, we can deduce that man became the image of God not only through his own humanity, but also through the communion of persons, which man and woman form from the very beginning. The function of the image is that of mirroring the one who is the model, of reproducing its own prototype. Man becomes an image of God not so much in the moment of solitude as in the moment of communion. He is, in fact, from the beginning, not only an image in which the solitude of one person who rules the world mirrors itself, but also and essentially the image of an inscrutable divine communion of persons. In this way, the second account could also prepare for understanding the Trinitarian concept of the image of God, even if image appears only in the first account. This is obviously not without significance for the theology of the body, but constitutes perhaps the deepest theological aspect of everything one can say about man. In the mystery of creation, on the basis of the original and constitutive solitude of his being, man has been endowed with a deep unity between what is humanly and through the body, male in him, and what is equally humanly and through the body, female in him. On all this, right from the beginning, the blessing of fruitfulness descended, linked with human procreation. From Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Flesh from my flesh, from Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. In this way, we find ourselves within the very bone marrow of the anthropological reality that has the name body. The words of Genesis chapter 2, verse 23 speak about this directly for the first time in the following terms, flesh from my flesh and bone from my bones. The man speaks these words as if it were only at the sight of the woman that he could identify and call by name that which makes them in a visible way similar the one to the other and at the same time that in which humanity is manifested. In the light of the earlier analysis of all the bodies man came in contact with and conceptually defined, giving them their names animalia. The expression flesh from my flesh takes on precisely this meaning. The body reveals man. This concise formula already contains all that human science will ever be able to say about the structure of the body as an organism, about its vitality, about its particular sexual physiology, etc. In this first expression of the man, flesh from my flesh, contains also a reference to that by which that body is authentically human, and thus to that which determines man as a person, that is, as a being that is also, in all its bodiliness, similar to God. We find ourselves, therefore, within the very bone marrow of the anthropological reality whose name is body, human body. Yet, as can easily be observed, this marrow is not only anthropological, but also essentially theological. The theology of the body, which is linked from the beginning with the creation of man in the image of God, becomes in some way also a theology of sex, or rather, a theology of masculinity and femininity, which has as its point of departure here in Genesis. The original meaning of unity, to which the words of Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 bear witness, was to have a broad and far-reaching perspective in God's revelation. This unity through the body, and the two will be one flesh, possesses a multiform dimension, an ethical dimension, as is confirmed by Christ's response to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 19, see also Mark chapter 10, and also a sacramental dimension, strictly theological, as confirmed by the words of Paul to the Ephesians, that likewise refer to the tradition of the prophets, Hosea, Isaiah, Ezekiel. And this is so because the unity that is realized through the body indicates from the beginning not only the body, but also the incarnate communion of persons, communio personarum, and requires this communion right from the beginning. 
masculinity and femininity express the twofold aspects of man's somatic constitution. This time, she is flesh from my flesh and bone from my bones. And indicate, in addition, through the same words of Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, the new consciousness of the meaning of one's own body. This meaning, one can say, consists in reciprocal enrichment. Precisely this consciousness, through which humanity forms itself anew as a communion of persons, seems to constitute the layer in the account of the creation of man and in the revelation of the body contained in it that is deeper than the somatic structure as male and female. In any case, this structure is presented from the beginning with a deep consciousness of human bodiliness and sexuality. And this establishes an inalienable form, norm, for the understanding of man on the theological plane. 